three boys were bragging about whose dad had the best job. So the first boy said, my dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a poem, and they give him $100. The second boy jumps in and says, hey, that's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a song, and they give him $1,000. And the third boy grins and says, oh yeah? My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a sermon, and it takes six men just to collect the money. <laughs> In our case, too. On this Labor Day weekend, we're paying tribute to all the laborers who have contributed to us, to, to our country and our cities and our homes. We are honoring each other this weekend for all the blood, sweat, and tears we have all shed in the fields of labor. It is through this blood, sweat, and tears that we are able to enjoy the strength and vitality of our country here, of Canada. So I have a question. Who here this morning is sick and tired of working? <laughs> Jim. He put both, both hands up. Who needs a permanent vacation from the workplace? <laughs> I'm not there yet. I've, I've just arrived. Uh, not me. I, I love my work, although I think that I would rather enjoy a three-day work week. If I could just work, right? If we could work just three days a week, we would be really happy. Yeah. And so while you may get tired of your job, while we may get tired of our job or even um, tired of working, we're learning that the Bible teaches that work has an intrinsic value. So we have come to learn about God through our Bible stories, but one thing is apparent through these stories, especially the Old Testament, and that is God is a worker, right? God is a laborer. Have you ever thought of God in this light? as a worker. So I'll go right back to the start of the Old Testament, a story that we all know. In Genesis 1-1, it states that God created the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 2-2 calls this activity work. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And he didn't stop working after creation. No wonder Psalm 111 verse 2 declares, Great are the works of the Lord, who are pondered by all who delight in them. God continued to work, and I'm here to tell you that God is still working today. God has not stopped. So by show of hands, how many of you would say that God is busy working in your lives right now? By show of hands. See? God is busy working in all our lives right now. God is at work creating a home with us. God is at work dispatching the Spirit to animate us, to make us more loving and empathetic and creative. God is at work dispatching angels into our lives whose tasks are to remind us of our worth and our goodness. God is busy, busy, busy and is the ultimate worker. And God is at work in full broadcast mode recruiting co-workers. God is recruiting co-workers recruiting us to join the family business of looking after God's creation. 
when we go back to Genesis 2.15, we see one of the jobs that God calls us to in, in, in the family business. We are to work at taking care of creation. So God planted the garden and birthed all the creatures, and as God's co-workers, we are to tend to the garden and care for the creatures, including us, including each other as human beings. So from my country and other Caribbean islands, and especially Mexico, uh, South America as well, Canadian farmers do a recruit every year for farm laborers or migrant workers. And I think, I was looking online, and they were thinking between 50 to 60,000 migrant workers are brought into Canada each year to assist farmers in being able to produce the foods that are brought to our tables every day. And I would say that they are essential workers. The farmers plant the crops mostly through machinery, depending on the crop. But these workers are needed to tend the crop and reap, reap or pick the produce so that we may be sustained. So too does Farmer God need us to tend to creation. Although we haven't done such a good job at it, have we? Not quite. But we cling to hope that we can become better co-workers to God in that respect. But this partnership between God and us, tending the garden and looking after the creatures, is necessary for our own physical and, and spiritual survival. Certainly it's necessary for the survival of the earth, as, as we could see the results of us not showing up to work. We could see the results right now. But the thing is, it's not easy to be God's co-workers, is it? It's not that easy. And let's keep it real. In our humanness, sometimes that employee of the month badge is oftentimes beyond our reach when we work with God. Probably because we're so distracted by all the things that are happening in our lives. Some of us can't show up for work to work with God because our lives have been so difficult. We have had to live with generational trauma, and so it's not that easy to show up to work. We have had so much loss in our lives, so much rejection, so much abuse. It's a miracle we could function at all. So how can we show up for work? How are we expected to show up for work? How can we be productive when we're dealing with all of this? And some of us, we may show up for work in God's vineyard, but we are late every day because we don't feel well. Last week, I talked about uh, some of us being poor and, some, and all of us at one point or another being poor in spirit. When we're poor in spirit, we don't feel well. So even if we show up to work, we can... We kind of sort of walk in a little bit late. We show up late because we've been given incorrect information and we're confused. We don't know where to go to show up for work. We don't know where the, 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 the place is for us to work. Because we were told that working for God requires us to be something we can't possibly become. We were told that we had to be born again. We were told that our skills weren't adequate to work in God's garden. We were told that we were underqualified to work in God's garden. And so we are so confused and, and we show up late. We don't know where to go. But we are making an effort to get to work every day. And some of us are just too busy enjoying our own lives to want to work for God. 
Some of us are just too greedy to want to work for God. We want to work for ourselves, right? We want to, we want to benefit from, from everything. We want to be profitable. And so we decide, no, we can't possibly work with God in God's vineyard. Working with God is not always easy. Sometimes it's hard. I wonder if it has anything to do with Genesis 2.18, where after the fall of Adam and Eve, the story explains that God, in exasperation, declared that the work will no longer be completely efficient because the ground would produce thorns and thistles. I wonder if it has something to do with that. You know, painful toil. As a minister, I can attest to that painful toil bit. Huh? Right, Allison? When you go to work with those kids day after day, sometimes it's painful toil, isn't it? Yeah, sometimes it's painful toil. The challenge for us is to recognize that even though labor can be hard and challenging, even though it's, it's our work, even though our work involves painful toil, we've been designed to work in tandem with God and not just by ourselves and not just for ourselves. In our scripture today, uh, Jesus is reminding us and calling us to do this work. And Jesus is reminding us that the work, that working with God is really not that easy. Jesus likens working for God to carrying a cross. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It's not easy to work for God. So what does it mean to carry your cross? It means sacrificing. To work with God, we're expected to work at giving up certain things. Meanness and hate and inflated ego and proudness and unkindness and unfairness. The things we do to bring each other down so that we may prop ourselves up. We have to give those things up. And sometimes it's not easy to give them up. Carrying our own cross may mean that we may have to work a little bit harder on some things than others probably do have to work at it. So there's a really good story uh, in the book of Acts. We read the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, where he was impressing upon them the value of work and working with God. He was on his third missionary journey and was headed to Jerusalem and eventually Rome, where he will be imprisoned. But he opened up his heart to, to the Ephesians in this last letter, and he told them about his own journey of, you know, working for the man and working for God. You know, working for the man, the regular grind where we go for 40 hours per week. So according to Paul, working for the man, um, this is how he explained it. Verses 33 to 35. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything that I did, I showed you that by this kind of work. The necessity of sometimes working for the man toiling in the field. But Paul was also sure to impart on them the importance of working with God. He said, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to, than to receive. 
Paul is issuing a challenge to his audience that work is important, that service is important, but that he also practiced com contentment with what he had and what he earned by saying, I have not coveted anything of, every, of, of anyone. And so discontentment is another thing that we might need to let go of as we work with God. We add that to the list. It's interesting. Um, I saw this, the article some time ago, but in the book, The Day America Told the Truth, James Patterson and Peter Kim revealed some, some shocking statistics about how far people would go for $10 million. They can't be content how far they would go for $10 million. So when people were asked what they would do if they would be guaranteed that much money, this is what they said. 25% of the folks polled said they would abandon their family for $10 million. 25% said they would abandon their faith for $10 million. 23% said that they would become prostitutes for $10 million. 16% said they would give up their U.S. citizenship for $10 million. I can kind of see that one. 16% said they would leave their spouses, their life partner, for $10 million. 7% said they would kill a stranger. 7% seven, seven they would kill a stranger for $10 million. What would you do for $10 million? We have to work hard at being content, don't we? We have to work at being content. And uh, remember, that there, a minister said this, and I, I remember the quote, but I don't remember who the minister was. And it is that, remember that contentment is not having everything you want. It's wanting everything that you have. We are to work at being content if we are to be God's co-workers. Labor Day provides a day off, working for the man. But my invitation to us today is to let Labor Day be a reminder that we should be seeking work in the vineyard as co-workers or colleagues of God. There is a beautiful hymn that says, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks. Compassion on our world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. Yours are his body. Our work is very important for God to be seen and felt in this world. And I just hope that you all show up for work. Thanks be to God. Amen.